I'm Alexis Ohanian. I've started startups, invested in them, and met amazing people using the internet to change the world. Our generation has an opportunity unlike any other. We can create small empires without anyone's permission. The internet is disrupting so many creative industries, right? There are startups now helping filmmakers, helping musicians, but what about artists who want to put stuff on your wall? Well, Artsicle here in Flatiron is turning the entire art establishment upside down. We are building technology to support artists and to help you discover the artists in your own backyard. Wow, you've got that down pat. For the last three years, we have rented out artists' artwork from the New York area. What if you could decorate your home with art, not have to worry if your investment was a big mistake? Kimberly Richardson introduces us to a program that lets you rent pieces of art, and if you like them, you buy them. Artsicle, think of it as Netflix of the art world. The new goal is we really want to organize the world's artists. Artists have been toiling away in secrecy, trying to create like the next big thing and be discovered. But really, we need to be able to find our artists in our own backyard so that we can connect with them and really enjoy the, what they're building. There are artists all over this country, all over this world, and some of them might happen to live in you know, Tulsa. Yep. Uh, like, what is that going to mean for those communities? I think the thing that's really important about that for me is that those artists in Tulsa are afraid to call themselves artists in a lot of cases. There's this definition that comes down kind of from up high right now, from, yeah. from museums, from galleries, from people that are um, gatekeepers, mm -hmm. saying, you know, you have, you have permission to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, you have permission to be an artist if you want to be an artist. One of the really interesting things about this company is that in sort of startup parlance, we always talk about how finding the right co-founder is like finding the right partner. Yep. It's not usually literally your partner as your co-founder. However, you and Scott uh, have made that work. What's one of the most important takeaways from the fact that you two are not only in a relationship, but also like running a company together? It's not something we necessarily recommend to everyone by any means, but Artsicle started as a side project and it really evolved from something we were gonna work on nights and weekends while we had our day job. And we got to figure out our kind of personal dynamic in advance of going out there and saying like, let's do this full time, let's hire people, let's go raise money and let's make it a company. So your daytime job, you were at Amex. Yes. What, what motivated you to, to take on this kind of side hustle, this, this side gig on the nights and weekends, right? You, you had a job that I'm sure was stressing you out like, like most full-time jobs do, right? You come home from work, most people, the last thing they want to do is think about starting a company. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yet you two made it work. What was, what was the motivation there? So I actually had an interesting situation at Amex in that I had a great first two years and I got myself promoted. Uh, into a job oh, I awesome. hated. Ah. <laughs> and I was getting to see what life was going to look like in that type of large comp company structure as you moved up the ranks. And so it wasn't even kind of being stressed in my day job, it was just realizing that I wasn't making things anymore. I had already been, I mean, one promotion, I was already done making things. And so starting Artsicle was about building stuff again. I'm gonna guess when you told your folks that, you know, being a nuclear engineer, doing this stuff, was nice, but not as cool as starting a startup uh, to help empower artists all over the world. They were like, awesome, or? For a while, they were like, okay, you're on sabbatical. So he was a full-time nuclear engineer. Yes, and doing he actually worked on a, he was working on a hardware project with a friend. On nights and weekends. Right. So he was like, I'm working on a sub today, and then I don't yes. know what kind of nuclear engineering he was doing, but then, <laughs> and then at night, it's like, no, 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 I don't have enough going on, I want to start a hardware company with yep. a friend. Okay. Yeah, so right. there you've got a personality type already there. Um, and that had failed pretty miserably and it had kind of gotten him excited about software. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the hardware yes. side, he was like, oh, got it. There's a lot of roadblocks. I'm yeah. gonna build software. And so he was teaching himself how to program, realized it wasn't that far from what he did in his day job. I only took one programming class in college. Of all I I was- Like a um, 101 CS course or? It, it was 101 Java. And it was like, at the end of that right. class, I knew what a linked list was, and I was like, wow, yeah. that's pretty useless. <laughs> <laughs> a, bunch uh, of Java, a bunch of Java developers right now are shaking their fist. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. All six of them. I was moonlighting at a startup um, for a couple of weeks before I quit my job. And just working there, like going home from nuclear engineering, going straight to the startup, uh, they're, they're like, you can work for free. I was like, cool, I will work. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and I touched Ruby or these new dynamic languages, and I was just like, oh my god, it's like building Legos. Yeah. Like, it still requires a lot of hours slamming my head against the computer, but I'm actually building something and I can show, show something on the screen so quickly. And then with the web, I realized I could show that to millions of people if I can just get them to look at it. All I did was throw out an early idea and say, okay, well, if you're working on something, could you start building me an e-commerce site? Because I want to help support artists. And then actually, he spent a ton of time on it because I was not learning how to program. I had recruited my 10 artists and then he was kind of on his own building out the tech for a while and he got really into the idea and took it to the next level of what if it wasn't just an e-commerce site for artists? What if it did more? So you're like, all right, gotta learn Rails. So I mean, are you just going to Google? Are you using like Rails for Zombies? Was that your tutorial yeah. of choice? Like how? Yeah, so sadly, none of that existed. <laughs> oh man. It was at the very beginning. Wow. Like okay. right now, anyone who's watching, like railstutorial.com is amazing. Yeah. Project Euler, those two, Resources now can get you started really fast. I didn't know about any of those back then. I don't think Rails tutorial existed. Uh, then I had a mentor at the startup I was moonlighting at. He threw me like the Rails 2 book from like um, McGriley or something. And that didn't really help. Once I put down the tutorials is when things really started to work. Uh -huh. Is once you start slamming your head against trying to solve a particular problem. Doesn't matter what the problem is, doesn't matter um, how important it is, but you were going to learn something by doing it. The very first thing I had done kind of in my adult life on the web is I had customized my Tumblr theme. That and was I, your that was And the I did it over and over again because I never liked it. And then I added, <laughs> you know, then I added some little ad widget at one point and then you, know, you figured out that broke everything and you learn how to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and once Scott kind of explained like what we need to do for the site is going to be basically what you were doing on your Tumblr theme. Yeah. on a different screen. Oh, okay, well that's not that scary. I also know that there's a back button, like I can just delete it and it goes, yeah. it's fine. It's kind of like you just gotta stick to those hours and when you actually get the fix, it's totally a rush of, I heard once that there was a heroin addict that started programming and that's how he thought of it. It's like, gotta get that fix, gotta get that fix, finally got it, and yeah. it's, it programming really is. Programming like heroin, but yeah. much better for your career. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You guys have a little bit of art here on your walls. Yeah. Let's really call some attention to your like favorite one. My absolute favorite is actually yeah. probably the one above the couch. That's the only one here specifically for this space. Um, so the rest of these have all recently been rented by someone and have been returned to us and we're hanging on to them until the artist picks them up. Which luckily there's always a decent number of, but this piece I just love. It feels like the energy of New York, all the different scenes. Um, all right, and so who's the artist? This is Genevieve Reed, and she was a street artist for years and got mm. tired of getting the tickets. And said so maybe she could work on a different medium and started doing yeah. really similar work except on wood and on canvas. Very cool. Let me, I gotta, I gotta ask about the, the fridge yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Startup Founders, you guys have to be so just innovative. You just yep. gotta hack stuff. Uh, what's the story of this fridge? This was a free fridge, and we couldn't really turn down a free fridge. Was it we was it like to... a street fridge? It or was, was not it a... a street fridge. Okay. It was coming out of someone's apartment, okay. but it was a pretty nasty fridge. Yeah. It was like a like 80s. It had been through some better days fridge, and so we wanted the free fridge, but mm -hmm. we wanted it to look a little better. Mm -hmm. And it got a layer of chalkboard paint, and it's become kind of a project for us. We get to draw things on it all the time. Yet. We're here in South Brooklyn, not far from Coney Island, in a neighborhood called Sheep's Head Bay, which is probably best known for being home to scores of immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Probably not the first place you'd expect to find one of the earliest adopters of Artsicle. I'm Dan Bina. I'm an artist of 29, living in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I ended up going to the Kansas City Art Institute on a scholarship. There I studied painting, sculpture, woodworking, and uh, built furniture, and I built these two chairs that we're sitting in Very now. comfortable chairs. Thank you. You are not a full-time artist, right? Correct. And so, so what, what pays the bills uh, to let you, you know, have this wonderful apartment as well as make your art? Well, I'm, I'm a full-time art handler at one of the big auction firms in New York. So, you know, commuting to Manhattan and, and I'm immersed in art history on a daily basis. I work with furniture, uh, decorative art and design, paintings, you name it. And this isn't just art, this is high art, right? This is, this is the stuff that auctions for tens of millions, millions. Tens and hundreds, hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions of dollars, okay. Lot six is the great Picasso, nude green leaves and busts, the 1932 Picasso of Marie Therese showing on my left, and $58 million to start this. 
74 million, 75 million, 81 million, 86 million, new bidder, 87 million, 90 million, 93 million. They're warning now at 93 million dollars. Last chance. See you're still. 94 million. Yes, 95 million. <laughs> you coming back in, Brett, at 95 million dollars. I'm selling it this time. Fair warning, you all done. And selling at 95 million dollars. Nick, your bidder at 95 million dollars. But then, your nights and weekends, you're making art of your own. From emerging artists, we have all this stuff sitting in our, you know, closets, in our flat files, and that's potential income. You meet these artists and they're just toiling away, working so hard and like really building out their craft in secrecy. The artists are making work constantly, that's what we do. The next question is, what does an artist do with all the work that they have? I mean, New York is notorious for space, right? It's, it's one of our precious commodities. So Art Circle has actually given me space to make more work. Someone asked me once, you know, what's, what's your medium of choice as a painter? And I'm like, well, it could be wine, could be bourbon, it could be beer, it depends <laughs> on the night. Yeah. But that seems to be what I consume more than paint. All right, let's uh, drink some bourbon and make some art. Oh, 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 oh. Sweet, right? Ooh. If more people knew about uh, the process, you know what I'm saying? I think there'd be more artists. Maybe. Some people have mistakenly identified me as an artist because of the digital art that I make. Right. It's a lot easier to make a straight line when you hold shift. So um, this could suck. I mean, it's, it's just like using a mouse, except your hand. In the art world, I, mean, I think a lot of people refer to the canvas or the paper as like the white dragon. You're always trying to slay the white dragon. It's like this blank page might be staring at you and you're really intimidated to make a mark. Yeah. And some people just say, make a mark, and then you could change it afterwards. What can I do to help you know, your side of this composition? This is a collaboration after all. Um, well, if I was being very diplomatic, I could yeah. say, well, how would you like to help me? Oh, well, you don't have to be diplomatic. Um, I, you, I guess you could put the brush down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I can already tell you've got this kind of, like, brush swag. That's what Bob would have called it. Who's Bob? Oh, Ross. Bob Ross, we're on a first name basis. Once the image is, you know, to my satisfaction, or to our satisfaction. Thank you. We'll upload it to the article site, mm -hmm. and then uh, it'll go live. I think it's 2013. <laughs> <laughs> why, why New York? This is the art capital of the world. This is where all the artists are. All artists are flocking to New York to be discovered kind of thing. But also just because of how multidisciplinary the city is, like walk across the street and meet advertising guys or uh, people like the Make a Revolution happening in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah. And uh, it really is just that it actually keeps you really grounded. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time in San Fran, but the echo chamber is kind of painful. We had uh, an investor really early on tell us that they would invest in us if we moved to San Francisco. So we no. had to actually think about this me? question. Who is this? Can we call uh, out this investor for being ridiculous? You know, I would actually, Scott and I would probably have to go back and look because they wanted, in their mind, they thought that if we were closer to them, they could better help us, um, which was kind, I guess. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and so we thought about it because we didn't really have an answer yet to why New York. I mean, yeah. at that time, yeah. we were just getting started, um, other than that we were here. Right. But we knew there was more to it. And for us, why New York is because there is the highest concentration of artists here creating really incredible stuff. And it's also the hardest audience I will ever have to deal with because New York has such a clear definition of what art is and what art a should be. A lot of haters. And we kind of said to ourselves, if we can, if we can win New York, then we have, we have this down. We can do art anywhere in the world. We can work with artists absolutely anywhere if we can get New York artists to not hate us. Yeah. And we have 250 New York artists who love us and work with us every day, and we're ready to go to the rest of the world. When someone rents something, you, know, you get an uh, email immediately updated saying, you know, someone just rented this piece. How do you feel the instant you see the photo of someone Instagramming, you know, one of your works of art in their living room? It's, um, 
voyeuristic. Yeah, and it's 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 fun. There's there's a great sense of honor that comes with that. You know, when someone says, "I like this," it, it means something because you're some message has gone through to them, and it, it's um, you know, in a sense, one of the highest rewards you can get as a maker of things. Uh, there was an instance where one of their collectors bought a painting of mine, a pretty substantial painting, and it it helped me with a lot of issues financially. Yeah. And so it, it was just, there's a real life economic impact. Yeah. And this was, it was just like, it was a Tuesday and all of a sudden you get an email notification. Exactly. And, and what was that like as you're <laughs> reading through it? I mean, you sort you jump out of your chair and you, you, you give a good howler and you, t you tell you, you, you know, I tell my wife and then she gets excited. And <laughs> yeah. You realize, you know, we could pay off this credit card. You know, it's yeah. Great. You taught yourself CSS, HTML, you're building out the site, you guys have the version that you're just embarrassed enough to launch. Um, what did it look like? Oh, gosh. Was it janky? Oh, yeah. It was a um, theme forest theme, wow, all right. which we bought for okay. like 20 bucks. All right, all right. And um, checkout didn't actually work. We found out the day we launched. <laughs> oh, we were on a plane. Right. Why, so, why? This is this is so inevitable. There are so many smart people who launch do this, companies yes. and then end up being offline for sustained periods of time immediately thereafter. Um, we launched the site and got on a plane down to Art Basel down oh, in Miami, Miami yeah. because we wanted to know what kind of the art elite would think about this thing that we were doing. The crowd's returning to Art Basel, Miami Beach. But this show is a, about a 400,000 square foot plus show. We basically ended up standing in front of the convention center, having people ask us where the bathrooms were because we looked like we were helping out with the event because <laughs> and did not get any publicity from the company at all. And yeah, I did get a call um, halfway through the first day from somebody because our phone number was on the site saying, nice. like, oh, I'm on checkout. Like, I'm just having some problems. I'm sure it's something I'm doing wrong. At which point Scott is sprinting back to the hotel <laughs> and hoping that he has good enough internet to deploy. What's it like the moment when you hear customer cannot complete checkout? You freak out back then because mm -hmm. you're new to this. It's terrifying. And that's really what you need to start building that tolerance for those situations where your heart keeps falling to the floor. Because mm -hmm. um, it's not, you know, you're supposed to say you are not your code, but mm -hmm. for those first few months, you really are your code. So the site went live um, in December of 2010, and it was terrible. So January spent completely rebuilding it, and in March we launched the first version of the rental site, mm -hmm. and things started to blow up on us. Yeah. Um, that was the first time we talked about it really publicly, and the press just kind of snowballed out of control. We set up two or three interviews, and that turned into something like 40 in the first two weeks that the site was live. At that point, we had been working in Dogpatch Labs for about three months, and we'd kind of made some early connections with people, and you know, I don't think we, we didn't really understand PR. We didn't really think that there was much strategy beyond. There which, is no strategy. PR is a You know, a we talked malarkey. to a couple of people that made this big deal and wanted to do this big exclusive, and we were like, eh, I don't really know. How about we just do small stories with three different organizations? Like, okay, so you identified, here's a journalist at a publication that we dig, yep. um, and you, you opened up Gmail, and, and what, what is that, so, do you remember what that pitch looked like? We had started working on Artsicle in like the previous summer um, on the side. We had started going to meetups, we would started going to events, so we knew the reporters at all three at that point, personally. Yeah. We'd had drinks with them. Yeah. We'd never had anything to ask them for. Right. And so I kind of just called them and said, I don't know if this is appropriate or not. Would you cover this? Uh, it was really that simple. And they said, well, maybe, what would it be? So, so let me just get this right. So you, you worked really hard on making something people wanted. Yep. Then you were, uh, you treated journalists like human beings, and then you were just really honest and asked if it they were really interested. It was really that simple. There are probably some members of the team here that we can distract. I bet there are. Let's, let's ruin so, some productivity. I, I feel like we should ruin Kevin's productivity for a minute. Oh, because your puppy has been yeah, it's your dog's fault. famous all day long. Yeah. So it looks like I've seen some uh, CSS here. Yeah, it's uh, a front end today. Front end designer. Um, we kind of do everything. Um, just everyone here does the full stack. We do sysadmin stuff, we do front end, we do all the rails. Mm -hmm. So we're wearing lots of different hats. Did you have any jobs before this? That base in the corner over there is actually mine. I spent a year at Juilliard. Oh, um, wow. I was a candidate for a master's degree in jazz bass. I hated my job. I mean, Wait, I hated- as a bassist? As a bassist. Really? I was playing professionally in New York for like four or five years. Mm -hmm. Did it all throughout college. And when I got there, I realized really quickly that it was not 
it was not the thing I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I quit Juilliard, didn't even get my degree, just dropped out and started learning to code. And I gotta ask, what, how did your parents react when you told them you were leaving Juilliard? Well, my dad's a programmer. So, uh, so he was like, it's about time. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was funny. Um, like, we never really had much to talk about. So when the time came, it was like, I'm actually gonna start coding now. And he's like, I told you, you know? <laughs> yes. I told you you should have done this like yes. a long time ago. You know, as a developer, you really can take your pick yeah. of where to work right now, uh, and probably for the near future. Why Artsicle? When I was looking at the job listings and like all the internships and all the places that were available, Artsicle really stood out because we were helping people that were like me when I was working and like struggling in New York, like playing gigs at 2 a.m. for $50. Like, there, we wish that people were building things for us to support us and to make time for us to just focus on being better musicians and rather than like managing all like our business contacts and all these things, just make us better creatives. Do you feel like we're missing out on great artists right now because of how inefficient it is? Because of, you know, showing in Chelsea because you got the lucky pull from the right curator to get there? Absolutely, absolutely. I, mean, I think, um, you know, Darger was discovered years after he died. He was a famous Chicago-based uh, folk artist. And now his work is really sought after, and he built an entire career almost completely invisible to the rest of the world. I mean, he was a recluse, and he might not have used Artsicle, but if somebody would have pointed him in that direction had the technology existed, we might have seen an entire different career for him. This is disrupting and upending something that has uh, been a very long tradition of, yeah. of people who uh, know about art, who know art, deciding this is art, yeah, uh, and exactly. whatever about that other stuff. Um, what, what do you think of the repercussions of that? I mean, the, the absolute repercussions will be huge. Like, we are planning on putting the creator on top where the, really, the content is king, and that who the creator is and what they're making is what matters, mm -hmm. and not what brands or agent is, are they selling through, mm -hmm. or has chosen them and, and anointed them as fine art. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't going to necessarily support one group of artists versus another artist. It's not kind of only the anti-establishment artists. Um, everybody needs this. Everybody needs a way to keep themselves organized and help their work be found by the community. And that can happen across all levels of careers from $10 pieces to $10,000 pieces. Artsicle is not only helping existing artists, it's also helping would-be artists come out of their shell. Art should be as diverse as the world we live in. You don't have to make something that would hang in the MoMA to make something that could hang on someone's wall. I just got a sale or a touchdown. I don't know what happened. So, what are we celebrating? It depends. Sometimes we celebrate big deploys. Sometimes we celebrate new artists. Sometimes we celebrate big sales. I'm going to celebrate Artsicle and a great shoot of Small Empire. 